And thank you very much for joining us tonight. My name is Doug, and I'll be your host for tonight. I'm the Education Events Coordinator for Nova Mass. And tonight we have Dan Pratt and Amelia Mead from Astarte Farm. And we have Josh Turner from Heritage Hemp. And tonight we'll be diving into no-till hemp and what it means for New England growers. We always wanna say thank you to our supporters. And tonight we have grant funding from Bay State Organic Certifiers, as well as Dr. Bronner's. And um, Dr. Bronner's makes pure cat steel soap, hair and body care products of the highest quality and are committed to socially and environmentally responsible products, all one. We most importantly want to thank most importantly, our, especially our members who make our education and advocacy work possible. Before we get started, we like to show this screen. This map shows, I'm showing New England, but it shows all of North America and other indigenous lands across the world. Um, we are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was inhabited and managed prior to European colonization. So with this image, we like to remind ourselves about the political and, and historical um, context that the land that we're occupying um, has embedded in it. Um, so that the descendants of white colonists, myself included, and white immigrants own most of the land in this country. Um, and it's due to mostly racist um, and classist practices, beginning with broken treaties and extending through sharecropping and redlining to the mortgage lending discrimination practices that are ongoing today. So we bring that up to help us all take a moment to consider the role that land ownership plays in the economic security, well-being, and capacity for self-reliance and political power of all people. And please consider this in the context of who owns the land today and why. This interact can be found um, at this link here and I'll post that down into the chat. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Dan and Amelia and Josh to just say a quick hello and um, introduce themselves and then we'll get started. Great. Um, I guess I will start. I'm Amelia Mead. Um, my father owns a Sarte farm. I came back about a year ago to the valley and um, the farm was started by Dan Pratt, who's about to say a quick hello, um, and then managed for five years once my family bought it um, by another woman named Annalise Claussen, um, who she and Dan together really set up the no-till practices here. And I've been lucky enough to learn from them both and kind of take over management. So that's now my role. I have a co-manager who's not here tonight, um, but together we kind of manage all the happenings um, on the farm and consult daily. Um, with Dan Pratt. Hi and welcome. It's a little bit strange to be having a workshop where you can't go out and dig your fingers into the soil and actually smell the incredible aroma of the plants that we're growing. But we have a lot of information to present and I hope it's in a clear format and that you will follow up with any questions for myself, Amelia or Josh. So, uh... I'm Josh Turner. I work with uh, Heritage Hemp and own and run um, a hemp genetics company called Yellowhammer Genetics. Um, I've been in New England for a couple of years now, and uh, I've had the uh, fortunate pleasure of working with uh, with Dan and Amelia and the great team over at Astarte on uh, growing and cultivating no-till hemp. Uh, I've been cultivating hemp since its uh, inception or reinception, I guess, back in 2014 out in Colorado. Uh, I've been in the cannabis industry and cultivating cannabis for a little over two decades. So um, if you have any, any questions regarding cultivation, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to get you, uh, get you some answers. So looking forward to the workshop. Great, thanks. To get us started, I have an introductory video. So I was fortunate enough to be over at Astarte Farm a couple of weeks ago as Josh and his crew were coming to harvest the, the first um, of the crop here. And um, I have this quick video for you all.
Um, so here's our crew. This is a squash, um, section of squash beds that were just harvested from. I bought this farm back in 1999 and operated it for 15 years and then sold it to Jim and Amelia Mead in 2015. It's been an interesting conversion process from a conventional farm to a certified organic farm to a 100% no-till, no-spray farm. And right now I'm sitting in the middle or at the edge of our certified organic hemp patch. We grow this hemp under contract to Heritage Hemp in Northampton and this is grown primarily for smokable flour. Like we, we're definitely gonna take this one down too. She's ready to go. We can get it get it out of here leave a little bit of these lowers that aren't fully mature, let them kind of mature a little more. Now this is a, this is probably pretty good. I don't know, I think we can harvest this one. Specifically developing strains for this climate. So that gives you a little overview. You get to see how diversified you all are at Astarte Farm, which is amazing. So um, I think you all can take over with your presentation. Great, all right, Dan Pratt, you ready to take it away? Sure enough, yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to say before I started, and it's really quite important, uh, an old saw for organic, or market gardeners is know where you're gonna sell your crop before you plant the seed. This is especially important for a crop like hemp, which is really highly controlled. And we were lucky enough to forge a relationship with Heritage Hemp and Josh and Yellowhammer Graphic, uh, gra genetics, thank you. Um, and so we had a contract signed. We knew what we would get paid for the crop before we put the first seed into a planting tray. And uh, it would not be something I would care to just hair off into optimistically. There was a lot of that in 2019 and quite a few people lost a lot of money or were left holding a lot of dried hemp at the end of the season. Um, the two things we did different in 2019 and 2020, the scraggly looking roots there that are set out on a board on a propagation table, that was a fairly severely root bound plant. And we started our seeds in a set standard 72 cell tray. Uh, we had them out of there really quick. It was maybe two and a half or three weeks but these are vigorous plants and it just wasn't quick enough. We, we still made a very nice crop, but when we started working with the leftover stumps and could see the contortions that the roots had had to go through in order to get their nutrients, we decided to go with a much deeper, broader uh, cell tray. So we found something, I believe it's called shore roots or 
for Deep Roots 50, and it's a 50 cell tray that's five inches deep. So that's my gloved hand holding um, one of the first transplants that came out of it. These plants have a very vigorous tap root, and they just really, they got to the bottom of that uh, five inch pot really, really quick. We left them in there for, I think we were close to five weeks before we planted, um, before we transplanted them out. So we started with a very uh, high quality compost based potting soil that we get from, um, Okay, Amelia, help me out. Who's our compost? Ideal compost. Ideal compost in Peterborough, New Hampshire. And they have already blended in some biochar for us. They do a lot of work getting biological activity in their potting soil. But we then needed to make the drainage much quicker on it because hemp really likes to germinate dry and it likes to grow dry. So we mixed in a good solid 20% of a horticultural perlite, and that's the standard little white um, balloon-like things that you see in a, in a potting soil, and it really lightened it up tremendously. Water would go right through it. We planted uh, late May, and that's one of the interesting things for us in New England about growing hemp, is it sort of fits in a slot in our season, if you will. The propagation house is pretty well getting cleaned out by this time. We've got most of the uh, most of the tomatoes are already getting hardened off. The eggplants and peppers are moving on. We have quite a bit of room in there. And even though you might be tempted to plant much earlier than this, it's really best if you can hold off because you don't really want to be on a step ladder in October trying to cut that top uh, cola off the plant. I mean, they will grow well over seven feet. We had some seven footers uh, that we were harvesting that were planted as late as uh, the very end of May. Um, I think we've had uh, we've had really tremendous success with the seeds that we got from Heritage Hemp. Amelia, can you show the next slide? Have we got the? Yeah, I'm figuring that out here. How's that? Yep. That's great. So um, we really try to keep the, the soil dry throughout the whole germination process. And this is a small problem, but it's one you might want to look out for. It's what I call a handcuffed plant. Basically, you've got your cotyledon leads, those first two leads that come out of the seed, and they have a seed casing stuck on top of them. It effectively shades the first true leaves, not completely, but you know, maybe 50%. So we have to then run a little hand sprayer on them, try to loosen up the seed casing, do a lot of little gentle pinching and pulling to try and open them up. I think next year, we're most likely gonna use some, um, uh, no, I'm sorry. We're gonna use something in the top inch of the soil that keeps it a little bit damper. And I'll remember, after a while, what that additional portion of the potting soil is going to be. We also used the fan quite a bit. There's the fan in the in the propagation house. We did that both to keep the soil as dry as we could, even on those hot June days, and also to make the plants vibrate a little bit. So we would turn the fan on for an hour, leave it off for an hour, turn it on for an hour, off for an hour. And what that does is really help to strengthen the stem of the plant. As you can see in the top right hand corner, already the plants are starting to arc out because they're looking for sunlight. That's just before we transplanted them in that photo. Next that's one. A, yeah, that's a great shot of those sure roots um, pots as well. Yeah. Great. So, um, while even before propagation back in April, we had to consider bed prep basically for, for where we wanted these transplants to go. And um, 
as those of you who are interested in no-till or doing no-till already, it's there's really not a one-size-fits-all approach to bed prep. Um, and we're always, you know, we're always looking at factors like what is the weed pressure? Um, are we direct seeding or are we transplanting? What crop was in this bed before? Um, all these, all these things kind of go into how do we want to prep a bed? Um, and so for the hemp this year, we used two, um, two types of, we, we bed prepped in two different ways. The first way was um, cardboard and wood chip application, which you can see down here. Um, this is a really, this is one of our favorite things we do on the farm. So we get, first of all, it's because all of the, all of it is free. So we get the wood chips from a, a local tree company um, and we get the cardboard from a factory down the road in Northampton. It's really important um, with organic farming that if you're gonna use cardboard, that you use cardboard that doesn't have any colored inks on it. So we have this great source of cardboard and wood chips. And so when we can, we love, we love to use cardboard and wood chips. It's a lot of labor to lay them out, um, especially if you're just doing one bed or one path, you know, you kind of have to run a wheelbarrow. We were lucky enough um, with using, doing such a large section of hemp um, that we were actually able to just cardboard a whole area and use the tractor to drop bucket, bucket loads of wood chips onto the cardboard. Um, so, so that's what we did for a portion of, of the section. I believe you guys have to help me out, but we planted, I believe 26 beds of hemp. Is that right, Dan? Um, I think we had 27 beds with 35 plants in each bed. Right. And about we had three more, three of those beds were upfield, but 24 of those beds were actually together in one plot. Um, and we, we didn't want to do just cardboard and wood chips for that whole plot. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, the first being that kind of historically, we've had mixed results with cardboard and wood chips. It's this great method, um, but we have kind of, we've had mixed results. And there's a couple hypotheses here. One is that the cardboard and wood chips actually insulate the soil and keep the soil a little on the cooler side and make it so it's not optimal for growing. Um, and the second theory that we have is that wood chips, because they're so high in carbon, um, in order to break down the microorganisms in the wood chips actually look to the soil for nitrogen. And so they take nitrogen out of the soil um, away from plants. So, so what we've done to kind of combat those two things is we've planted crops that don't need to be super, super warm into cardboard and wood chips. Um, and we've also been sure to, when we, we, we plant into the cardboard and wood chips, we make sure we're pushing the wood chips away from the transplants. And we also um, have started kind of, we've been using aged wood chips, six, six months to a year we found is kind of ideal. So, so with that, we were feeling pretty confident about the cardboard wood chip application, um, but we decided to also, um, here's the next slide. We decided to also just on top, on bare soil, roll out these round bales of straw that we had laying around the farm. And in order to prep for that mulch, what we did was we ordered four large, large silage tarps and occulted the ground for about, it was either four to six weeks before transplanting. Um, this was kind of just an interesting no-till learning moment that we had here. Underneath this, these, this black tarp here was a massive, we had tons and tons of weed pressure. This was another reason we didn't want to do cardboard and wood chips over this area. Um, and that came about because we actually solarized with clear plastic in the winter months on this weedy patch. Um, and I don't know if any of you no-till growers have tried to do that but that's actually a big, big no-no. Um, solarizing with clear plastic is super, super effective and really quick when you have days that are above 80 degrees around there, when you have warm days in the summer. But in the winter, if you use clear plastic, what happens is you kind of get a greenhouse effect, right? So it was basically like prime growing weather for weed seed. So ah, it was kind of a nightmare. Um, so we didn't really, we weren't feeling super confident about this section here. So we decided to occult for four to six weeks and we felt like, okay, that'll do the trick. Then we'll lay down some straw mulch. So those are the two primary methods of bread prep that we used. Um, 
And then a third that we used was kind of this wild, um, so we had these three beds upfield that we got to experiment a little bit with. Um, and one of, the, one of those beds we actually planted into fava beans. And I have a video for you all um, from our field manager, Ellen Drews, kind of talking about this bed prep process. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's a quick video about the third technique that we used. Up over here, it's fine. Ready? Uh, ready. So here's the here uh, here's the bed that we're putting planting our last bed of hemp into. Um, and Alan, can you tell us what we're doing for bed prep? Yeah. So this was a garlic bed until two weeks ago, a week ago. And we also had fava beans growing in between the garlic, which gave it an extra boost of nitrogen. And so um, we've still got a lot of that nitrogen in the bed. We left the fava bean residue right on top. And there's also compost um, that we planted, that we put down along with the garlic. So now what we're doing is just pulling, we've got some perennial weeds, um, which we call torpedo grass. I think it goes by a lot of names. So we've got to pull that out. That's been kind of thriving in the garlic crop. Um, and then we'll plant one row of hemp, hemp right down the row. Um, each plant gets five feet of spacing between the plants. So they're going to be very big plants. We're going to be happy. And we're going to do, we've done a variety of different mulches, right? And what are we going to do yeah. for this bed? So this one, I believe we're doing straw mulch on top of all this compost and fava bean re residue. Um, and then in other beds, we've done straw on top of um, sort of bare soil um, when we've done cardboard and wood chip mulch and then cut it back and planted right into it. So we'll be able to compare all these different treatments. Great. So once the beds were prepped, um, as you could see in the drone footage that Doug took, the, we, we planted in offset rows with five foot spacing between each plant. Um, instead of manually digging holes, we used um, a half inch electric drill with a three inch auger um, to actually dig the holes for us. And we, in order to do this, we had to run a generator down the field, but it ended up being super effective and definitely a big time saver for us. Um, once the holes were dug, what we did was we pushed, whether or not it was cardboard and wood chips or that, that we were digging into, or just the straw mulch, we were sure to push the mulch back so that was what was actually going into the hole that the transplants were going into was just soil and then actually a little compost to, to top it off. So Dan, you wanna talk a little bit about um, transplanting and um, the actual growing process here? Jim and I went down there roughly at eight in the morning and we were finished by 10.30 or 11 each day. It was pretty, uh, a pretty hot July, you might all remember. And we wanted to get the planting done before the afternoon sun really started baking things. I would like to say that the, uh, the auger, it, it was an effective digging tool, but I was certainly glad that Jim was doing all of the drilling. <laughs> because if that auger catches on an old root or a little bit of compacted soil, it would like to spin you right around. So it's not something to attempt unless you're, uh, you're feeling in a good stance, let's put it that way. The uh, plants actually were kind of hard to get out of those deep trays. We might try a shallower uh, shore root 50 next year. I think they have a three and a half or a three. The five foot was really giving us great root balls, but it, it soon became apparent that I was gonna have to go in there and cut the bottom out of each one of those cells and then stick my thumb up in there to really get the plant to release. We had pre-soaked them. I think we pre-soaked them in a fish and kelp emulsion, uh, but they just would not let go. Once we had them out, uh, once we had the holes drilled in our nice straight line, uh, which I think you can see there's a piece of rope there in the middle picture, which was lining us all up, uh, it was a fairly easy matter to hold the plant over the hole, use the other hand to pull in the soil so that you're getting it at the correct planting depth. We were looking for roughly the cotyledon leaf depth. Some of them 
went to the first true leaf, which would have been a little too deep, but, but it didn't hurt the plants at all. And then uh, the last step was to take a small shovel full of compost and sort of make a halo of compost around each plant. And Jim and I together, and, and we're uh, not young folks anymore, were able to plant three rows the first day, three rows the second day, and we slowly picked up speed to where we were getting up to four and five beds of, of 35 plants. Now it soon became apparent as we were growing out with these different mulch techniques um, that the stuff in the wood chips and cardboard was not prospering as well. I believe we had to take a tractor down and add additional compost because uh, the plants on the left were planted prior to the plants on the right in the middle photo. I mean, the difference was just night and day. There was a darker color of green on the straw mulch stuff. Uh, we were just struggling kind of on all fronts. And because it's such a strong plant, by the end of the year, there was not really that big a difference. You could still tell the difference between the, the two techniques, um, but they did finally catch up and start to start to do well. Otherwise, we did a couple of crawls down there, pulling, uh, pulling our lovely grasses out, a few, uh, few perennial weeds and pig weeds. But as you can see, the plants grew quickly and started shading even the pathways um, really rapidly. Now the stuff that was on the straw was so thick, it, it was difficult to walk down there. I mean, you would be tripped by the lower branches and you couldn't, you couldn't even wiggle around the plants. Whereas in the wood chips, you could sort of weave your way through the, through the patch. We got some problems we want to talk about? Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's to, to just go off of that, the growing was really, you know, the easy part for the most part. It was just a lot of waiting, um, but we definitely had some challenges, which, Dan, you wanna talk about those? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the pictures first because I love talking about green things. So that is uh, a female plant on your right. And that is the one male plant that we found out of 900 on the left. And that's really a testament to Yellowhammer genetics and the fact that we're growing feminized seed and we were only plagued with one male plant. You don't want to leave that male plant in there at all. You're not growing seed for food. So we chopped that one or pulled it right out of the field. On the right is the female plant and you can see the two anthers coming out of each flower. It's really easy to get confused if you've never done this before. Sometimes one of those anthers is sort of curled up and it, it looks a little bit like the pollen sac on the male. But once you've seen a male, I, I swear you won't ever forget what that plant looks like. Now we did run into a little wind damage because we had some really severe wind this year and the wind blew so strongly in an east-west direction straight down our field that the plants twirled in their holes and actually left sort of ice cream cone shaped holes down six, eight inches into the soil, leaning over some of them at 30 degrees. Jim and I just went back into the field and basically just tamped the soil back in around the plants as we held them up. I think we had to stake a dozen, maybe 15 plants that really were severely affected, or they all survived and all continued to grow strongly. I mean, it took them a week or two to really recover, but they, they picked right on up. Frost damage, for gosh sakes, we had uh, frost in the middle of uh, September this year, so there, it was cold enough, it actually nipped some of the buds. That's actually very rare to happen that early, and hemp will go through some pretty low temps Without, uh, without a severe problem. We had some uh, bud rot, which is mostly caused by caterpillars. I think what we have here is a European corn borer on the left. And we have possibly a fall armyworm on the, in the center. Uh, those guys, they can make a mess out of an individual bud and you just kind of have to be vigilant. 
you're looking for a brown shriveled shrivelly looking thing and you cut that part of the bud out and the rest of the plant does very well lower right hand coral corner that's our uh, septoria leaf spot um, that can be a devastating disease but we basically were able to outgrow it or keep up with it this year if you have a little bit of it you might want to go in there and remove all the spotty leaves take them out of the field dispose of them elsewhere we really just let this let this go and uh, and it paid off for us. Did I miss anything on that first slide, Amelia? I think you, you did it justice. I got them all. Yeah, those were really the big the big challenges. Oh, I forgot to mention rabbits. Oh, rabbits. Uh, yeah. have rabbits chewing on the bark of the hemp plants, and they would just girdle a plant, and the plant can't live without its bark. Very easy to see because it basically just kind of collapses in the field. It wilts and drops, droops all its leaves. Uh, we didn't do anything except sprinkle some fox urine and I don't think it was very effective, but we tried. Um, I think we lost a half a dozen plants to rabbits. So <clears throat> we just want to speak for a moment to kind of the beauty of growing hemp in a no-till system and some of the things that we noticed this year and last year that we really think were kind of unique to, to no-till hemp. Dan, you want to mention those? Well, sure. Uh, it's Hemp is actually has a reputation as a soil improving crop. Now, that is not to say that it doesn't require a fair amount of nutrition to grow a six or seven foot tall hemp plant that's as big as a Christmas tree, but it really does an amazing thing to the soil because of its fantastic root system. So you have the tap root going straight down, and I don't know how far down they go, but I'm sure they're drawing up minerals and nutrients from the subsoil profiles. And um, it's just uh, amazing to see when we cut the hemp plant, you know that all of that fungal activity, all of that bacterial activity that was happening around those roots is now basically just spreading out in your soil and making, uh, making an incredibly rich ecosystem for the type of biological activity we're looking for in a no-till system. Uh, the picture on the left is actually a weed up at the top left, and that's just to show what happens in our soil where we get this incredible aggregation. You pull out a weed and every root is like coated with soil particles because, and, and this is during a drought, mind you, because it's just so happy to have all of that activity that it continues to make more little pieces of humus for us, even if it's a less than desirable weed. <laughs> mushrooms, we're always happy to see mushrooms on the farm and they were mushrooms of plenty growing all around the bases of those hemp plants even before we cut them. And the middle shot there is just I mean, I, you can't really see it, but we have a beetle bank on the left, then we have the hemp, then we have a mowed path, then we have a couple of beds of mixed cover crop. And uh, it really has just brought a, a whole new level of life to the farm. Cool. So something just to, before Josh talks about kind of what we did um, after the growing, just to let you guys know kind of how we handled after the plants were out of the field, we had all these stumps in the ground. Um, and Dan just kind of mentioned, but we love to leave stumps and roots in the ground um, because of all the microorganisms that like to grow around the roots. Um, and also because these root systems actually aerate the soil and create pathways for water to be held onto or water to be drained. It's kind of like this sponge system. So once all the hemp was out of the field, we actually ran a flail mower um, and got, got the stumps as flush with the ground as possible. Um, and here's just a, to wrap up a quick video of Dan talking about one of those stumps and a shot of what those stumps look like, looked like. This is what one of the hemp stalks looks like. 
about a week after being cut, we started cutting, I believe the 1st of October. Plants were transplanted into the field early July. So they had about nine months of good growth. And I know I'm shaky, but maybe you can see that there's already the beginnings of some bubbling. The sap is coming up out of the roots. Really great thing to do is drop a shovel full of compost, active compost right on top of the cut stumps. That will speed the uh, deterioration of that stalk and on down into the roots, which extend many, many feet from where this plant stood. Great. Well, that's that's the end of our portion. Um, we'll take questions at the end, but we're going to turn it over to Josh Turner to talk about harvest, drying, and processing. Thanks. All right. So, um, trying to to pick up and, and realize that we have a, a little bit of time left, and wanted to leave time for questions. Um, so, one of the most common things I see. Um, with with farm and hemp and hemp farming is and mistakes is not at the beginning of the year it's always at the end of the year and planning for the harvest and drying properly processing all this material um these plants are very large like dan was saying some of them you know on their farm planting you know uh mid-june early july still reach seven eight feet tall um, these plants take up a lot of space and there's several different ways to dry them. Uh, probably one of the um, most common methods is, is to hang dry the plant. Um, it's kind of similar to what you would do with like tobacco. Uh, and it's just to air dry it. You want to do this in a cool, dark uh, environment with good airflow. Um, that preserves the terpene content of the plant, prevents mold and mildew and things from building up, but it really gives you the best, highest in quality um, in product, especially if you're going for like a smokable flower or if you're, you're going for oil uh, with a high terpene content as a crude oil, not like a distillate or an isolate type material. So... Um, there are hemp dryers out there. You can build flatbed dryers. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, so here's a few pictures um, of how we kind of process. I'm going to scroll through this. So here you can see um, these whole plants hanging um, in our facility, and they take up an enormous amount of space. Um, and we hung these. This is a 25-foot ceiling. Um, and so we've got these plants literally hanging from the ceiling to the floor. Uh, we cut some individual flower off of um, the colas and in buds and things like that. And so we would take those and hang trellis netting from the ceiling to floor and hang our um, flower that way, basically in just like a wall of flower. Now, I was talking a little bit about kind of the flat beds. Here you see what we've done is we've built these um tables out of two by fours it's just a two by four framed out square and then we used um quarter inch um nesh steel galvanized um uh, material and basically built a a table that air can flow through the bottom and the top and then you can stack those tables um on top of each other i don't think i have any where they're stacked um here you can see one of our workers hanging up a uh, flower. Um, but doing that and putting that on those tables, you can dry an enormous amount of material in a small space. The only thing is, it's getting the material off of this branches, what we call shucking the material down or bucking the material down. It's a super labor intensive process. So once you start harvesting the plants, you either have to have space to hang and dry them all uh, and then the, the labor and the, and the workforce to handle uh, this process. And it is by far the most labor intensive part of the season. Harvesting is 10 times more labor intensive than 
the planting and cultivation of the hemp itself. And it's the most crucial part because it's where things can go wrong quickly if you aren't well organized and don't have everything um, kind of prepared. So going through, um, this is a uh, one of the things that can speed up that process of removing the material from the stems. This is um, called a munch machine. It's basically an electronic bucker or shucker. Uh, they're kind of expensive, but we um, found out that we could replace about 10 human bodies with one of these machine and accomplish uh, the same amount of material being shucked uh, in the same time frame. Uh, with one of these machines with the right worker and the right process, you can you can do about well the size of, of plants that they had at a start day, which were really large plants. Um, you can get about 300, 250, maybe 300 of these done in about a 10 hour shift. So um, there's some unique tools out there. You can see where we, we have just brought these plants in. So what we did is we cut these plants in the field. We loaded them into a, a trailer and we brought them over to our facility to hang. Um, this quickly filled up the square footage that we had available to dry and hang these plants. Um, it takes about seven days. Um, to properly dry and cure a whole plant. It's a little bit quicker if you're doing just the flower. Um, but here you can see, I mean, you know, this was maybe one, two rows of plants that, um, you know, that ended up hanging from the ceiling and they're, they're extremely large plants. Um, so there's, there's a lot of misconception that no-till growing leads to much smaller plants. And I have to say, over the past two years working with Astarte and seeing um, the production they get on the, the space that they grow, I would argue that it's probably much more productive than your average tilled farm. Um, so here's a shot of us just hanging our flower uh, from, the, from the ceiling. This will dry this way. Um, so you can see there's space between the two um, trellis netting and that gives plenty of airflow through uh, to let, you know, the water evaporate off in the gases. There's a lot of off-gassing that's taking place here. And so this will dry in about five to six days um, where it takes seven to 10 days to dry a, a whole plant. Um, so a couple different methods um, to dry. There's also a, a gas powered dryer that you can get that's kind of similar to a, um, a pizza oven I, and I had we, we actually have one of those up in Bernard's so I couldn't find a picture of it and um, it's not the best way to dry if you're looking for a really high quality end product especially if you're growing organically it's not a certified organic way of drying um, and it really reduces the overall quality of the end product so um, I guess some of the things that I would say um, just kind of wrapping up on harvest a little bit would be plan ahead. Make sure you have plenty of space to dry your product. Um, for every acre you grow, I would say you need around 5,000 square feet to properly hang and dry that. This year, um, with the passage of the 2018 um, Farm Bill, and the new USDA regs that came down, um, let me see if I can, can get rid of that. Uh, how do you, okay, there we go. With the farm bill passing and the new regs, we have 15 days from the day we got tested to harvest our crop and have it out of the field. Uh, you do get a total of three tests, but MDAR was really difficult to work with. Um, and I, I'm sure if you farmed hemp in mass, you, you've had your own experiences with, with MDAR. Um, so there's not a lot of time, basically. Once you get tested, you have 15 days. And it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot of really hard work to get this done. And it takes a lot of space. So plan ahead. Um, make sure you have plenty of space, plenty of crew. Um, make sure you have a proper environment to dry in. You want to have good airflow. That's the key. You want to try to keep it cool. Darkness is great if you can keep the area dark, fine. But if not, Airflow is the biggest thing because you don't want to put your crop in and hang it in an area to dry and all of it mold and go to 
uh, to waste, and that can happen very quickly. Um, basically, it can it can happen overnight. But as long as there's good airflow, you're not gonna you're not gonna see mold, especially if you keep it cool. Um, and then after that, once it's dry and it's hanging, you've got some time. Once it's properly dried and it's hanging, um, you've got some time to then process the material to take it down to bucket off the stems and reduce its size and to put it into proper storage containers. For long-term storage, uh, once you've got it dry and you've got it removed from the stems off the main stalk and bucked down into more of a manageable material where they're either gonna dry it or you're gonna process it into oil, um, some of the best things to store in are, I don't know if you guys know, the, the lawn bags that you can get from like Lowe's and Home Depot, they're like kind of thick three-layered leaf bags, they're paper bags. Um, those work really well for kind of the finishing process of drying. You can move the material into that. It's, it will absorb some of that leftover moisture and it breathes. So it lets the material off gas and then go from that paper bag. And we like to use goose bags. They're basically turkey bags, but they're, you know, five and 10 gallon size. We store long term in the um, black plastic totes with the yellow top that you can get from like Home Depot. We use the 27 gallon ones. Um, and so we store long term in that and we do a burping process. So we'll seal the bags up overnight and then we'll open the bags up every day for about two weeks. Um, once the material is dried and put into its kind of final container until it's ready to be packaged for sale, we'll burp that material as it off gases. Um, it's not crucial that you do this. It just provides a, a better in quality product helps preserve the terpenes and the true characteristic of the flower um, that you've grown in the field. So um, from there, depending on the your end use product, you know, will depend on how you process your material. Some people will take all of their, you know, quote unquote biomass and flour, and they'll run it through a trimmer and they'll package it for sale as smokable flour. Some folks like to use extraction method. You can use ethanol. There's CO2 extractors out there. Uh, there's rosin presses. There's a, many different ways to get oil um, and different types of oil from your plants, depending on your scale and your end use. So um, I, I guarantee you that, that um, it's a rewarding crop to grow. It's difficult getting through some of the regulations. I know one of the benefits like uh, Dan and Amelia uh, talked about with working with a company like Heritage is we took care of and take care of all of the uh, kind of paperwork and dealing with the state and all of that and let the farms just deal with what they do best and that's farming. And so um, if, if you're a small organization, small farm, organic farm, I won't say you know, don't be intimidated by the paperwork. It's not difficult to do. And I'm always available uh, for anybody that needs to, you know, ask questions about any of this stuff. Uh, don't ever hesitate to um, to contact me or get in touch with Dan and Amelia and they can get you in touch with me and I can help out in any way possible. Um, but it, it, it can be a little challenging in dealing with you know, different regulatory agencies now. There's a fingerprinting process and all of this stuff that you have to go through. But um, yeah, harvest is, uh, I, I think I'm still dealing a little bit with the, the PTSD that comes from harvest from this year. It's been every year. This is my, uh, for hemp, I guess this is my sixth, seventh year of hemp harvest. And um, every year they, they, they don't get any easier, I don't think, but uh, they're always fun and rewarding once they're over, so. Uh, I know we've only got a few minutes left. I, I guess we should probably take some questions. Josh, I'm wondering, um, I think we've got until 8.30. I'm wondering, could you oh, maybe okay. speak really briefly about um, how to know when the, the hemp is actually ready to harvest, just purely from looking at a plant? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, I get this question a lot from um, different farmers all over the country. And so there's a couple of different ways. Um, with normal, if, if, you've, if you're familiar with farming cannabis, um, THC laden plants, the THC molecule will oxidize and on a lot of THC based plants, they will, uh, if you look at, at the plant with a microscope with a jeweler's loop, you'll see that the trichomes, the small mushroom looking 
um, attachments on the leaves, on the sugar leaves and the, and the calyxes, they will look amber. The, and the, the ball of the trichome will have an amber color or a cloudy color as the THC molecule oxidizes and, and it, the plant becomes more mature. However, unfortunately, CBD plants don't really do this. So there's no real like traditional methodology that, that you can kind of cross over, or bring over from that side of the industry to say, oh, well, our plants are mature. Now, however, they may not amber, but some of the plants will get cloudy trichomes. So late in the season when your, your buds have, uh, and we'll go through this as well, but you can look under the loop and look at your trichomes and see if they're 50% or more cloudy, normally they're very clear, they're crystal clear, but if they become cloudy 50% or more, that usually means they're ready to harvest. But before I even start looking at trichomes, what I like to do is I'll watch the plants grow, right? Most of the hemp varieties out there prefer about a eight to 10 week flowering period. So hemp and all cannabis um, is a photo period dependent plant. Around mid-August, when our daylight is limited to about 13 and a half, 14 hours, the plants will enter into a pre-flower phase. And then uh, we'll, around the third, fourth week of August, we'll really kind of say, you know, the first week of flower. And sometimes, depending on your geographic location, you know, in your latitude, and even in microclimates, you'll see different stages of when flower starts. Some may start early in August and some may not start until September. But once you start to see the flowering uh, parts of the plant develop, um, you'll see that the, the plant will go through what we call the stretch. So that first like week or two of flowering, you'll see this enormous growth in the plant. Um, they'll double, sometimes triple in size. It's a, it's a state of in, incredibly vigorous growth. Um, I've recorded plants that have grown up to a foot um, in a 36 hour period. So you'll see huge, huge growth rates. Um, plants consume a lot of water during this time. They consume a lot of nutrients during this time. So if you're irrigating or feeding, you almost can't give too much water, too much nutrients during the stretch, that first two to three weeks of flower. Once the plants stop growing vegetatively and start focusing more on their flower production, you start watching that flower develop. It's, it starts out really small and airy, and then it starts to cluster more and the plants start to fill out and the flowers start to develop and mature. And once you, you know, about six weeks in, you'll see that the flower has kind of developed into its final structure um, and that there's not really a lot of new flower development taking place on the plant. The, that is where we start entering the late flower phase. And that during that late flower phase, you'll start to see the swelling up of the developed flower and the maturity of it. And so the calyx will start to swell. Um, it will start to produce copious amounts of resin you'll really notice an increase in the terpene contents and the smell of the plant. So if your plants have been growing happy and healthy and they're disease free throughout the year, once they reach this late stage and once you kind of like touch the flower and grab a hold of the flower, you'll see that it starts to become very dense. Like some flowers will be kind of squishy and have a lot of airy, you know, an airy structure to them they're not ready when they're still really airy. Your plants only get ready once they're pretty dense. The flowers are pretty dense. And you'll start to see the overall plant will start to tell you when it's mature. You'll start to see that the fan leaves will start to yellow and fall off. We'll start to see what we call the fade. And the fade is when the plant has reached, you know, it's kind of end of its life cycle and it will start to drop leaves and the leaves will fall off. Um, and so that's usually, you know, with the new THC rules, you're not most likely not gonna be able to get to the fade before you have to harvest. Uh, Cause if you get to that level of maturity, 
there's I don't know that there's even a single variety on the on the market right now that will go to its full maturity and still pass total THC testing. So you might not see the the fade. Um, and honestly, Amelia, we may not be able to get plants all the way to their you know late stage flower development and still maintain that total THC mark. So unfortunately, with the rules we have, we can't let the plant mature to its mature, get to its maturity where we would normally harvest it. We're going to have to use the THC level to tell us when the plants are mature and when it's best to harvest. So that that is what I recommend farmers who are growing hemp do. Test your plant starting about the third week of flower. So around the first week of September, get a baseline THC level. Test your plant mid-September, get another THC level. And that will give you at least two data points to, so you can kind of extrapolate when about you're going to have to harvest to stay under that 0.3% mark. So, um, but yeah, testing is is incredibly important. Um, just hearing kind of through the grapevine, um, I know that over half of the farms planted in mass this year, hemp farms, um, have failed their initial THC test. Um, Dan was talking about genetics earlier. Probably the single most important decision you can make in choosing to farm hemp is your choice of genetics and getting genetics from a reputable seed breeder. Um, do your due diligence and, you know, make sure that they have proper paperwork, make sure they have proper COAs from labs, um, ask to speak if you call a seed company and inquire about purchasing seeds. Seeds are expensive on average, um, seeds can range anywhere from a dollar up to three dollars per seed. Um, and you know, if you're buying in bulk quantity of a hundred thousand seeds or more, you'll probably get a little bit of a price break, but not much below 75 cents per seed. So, do your due diligence with seed companies, ask to speak to other farmers who have grown that, that company's seed. Ask them what their experience was. Ask them, did they have, you know, direct communication with the breeders and the seed company? You know, what was it like in, in experiencing them? I've dealt with a lot of farms over the years, small farms to really large, you know, tens of thousands of acres of hemp farms that have uh, purchased bad seed and ended up putting all this time, effort, and money into cultivating a crop that they ended up having to bulldoze because it went hot. Um, so do your due diligence on your seed. One of the things that I'm working really hard on as a breeder is to develop varieties that will finish much earlier in the season here so that we can avoid some of the inclement weather like Dan and, and Amelia were talking about earlier that we saw this year, the unusual early frost, the high wind. Um, sometimes it's, you know, an enormous amount of rain. Um, it's pest pressure and things like that late season. Um, so early finishing varieties um, are a good way to go. Um, yeah, that's that's about all I can uh, think about on that there. Um, anything else we, we should mention as far as uh, trying to think of any topics for harvest testing? Um, Long-term store. Oh, long-term storage. So if, once you, uh, Dan mentioned that some farmers um, may still be sitting on material from last year. And, and I know that there are a lot of farmers still sitting on material from last year because they didn't have a proper outlet. There were so many farmers that farmed in 2019 and the infrastructure wasn't in place to process all of the material. If you get into a situation where you are sitting on material, you can properly maintain that material so that it has a long shelf life by storing it properly. And to store it properly, you want to try to prevent oxidation. 
and you want to keep the temperature stable and keep the humidity levels low. Um, if you allow large fluctuations in temperature and humidity and you allow oxidation to take place, your CVD will start to degrade. Uh, your terpenes will vaporize basically and you'll be left with a product that you still have as biomass, but it's no longer of any use to anyone because the quality is, is deteriorating. So if you do grow a crop and you end up having to sit on it for a little longer than you anticipated, uh, plan on long-term storage. If you have access to a walk-in cooler or freezer, you can freeze the material. You can put the cooler um, in or put the material in a cooler or freezer to slow down its degradation. I know uh, there's a company called CareTube. Uh, they make these cardboard tubes that are designed specifically for long-term storage of cannabis uh, and hemp. Um, there's a company out there called Hemp Bags. Um, they make these um, plastic kind of like, they look like trash bags, but they're made to fit inside of like a cardboard tote. Uh, one of the large, you know, like three by three by three cardboard totes. Those bags can be sealed um, and you can actually vacuum out some of the air from inside of those to remove the potential for oxidation. Um, there's other storage options, um, including nitrogen sealing. So you can take your storage pack and suck all the uh, air out and replace that air with nitrogen, kind of like they do with potato chips, and that promotes um, long-term storage. So there's a few things that you can do that, so if you, if you do get stuck sitting on your product, it, it's not as perishable and you would, this will give you some time to, to get it to market or find a, a buyer. So, um, Would you touch yeah. again on the specific temperature and humidity requirements for dry curing? And then does that sure. change for storage? Yeah, so in the, so when you first take your plants out of the field, they're going to be somewhere between 80, 90% moisture content. Um, the first two days, the first 48 hours, really, you're going to have the mo majority of your water loss take place during that first two days. The environmental conditions we're shooting for for an optimal drying temperature is around 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit with a humidity level around 50 to 55 percent with some air flowing. Th you know, just it doesn't you don't want direct air blowing directly onto your plants. You just want air flowing around in the facility, preventing stagnation and keeping air uh, moving through so that the moisture coming off of the plant doesn't stay right there around the plant so that that moisture moves off, dry air comes in and prevents mold building up. Once you've got your product dry down to about a 12 to 15% moisture content, um, one thing that we found that worked really well is you can get these moisture meters that are, um, they're made for testing moisture content and lumber, and they're pretty cheap. You can get them for about, I don't know, I think we picked a couple up off of, uh, uh, or at the hardwood, hardwood store, hardware store for 25 bucks, I think. And on the back of those meters, it has, a, you don't want the ones that has the two prongs that you stick into the wood. It has a small little disc on the back of the meter that you actually press the your flower into, and it will give you um, a a moisture readout of your content. So once once you hit that twelve to fifteen percent mark, your material is dried, and now you want to cure the material. And so you take the material down from your hanging facility and move it to its either its final container or an intermediate container. I usually like to go into those um, lawn bags, the paper bags that are that are pretty large. Um, I don't like to get my flower. That's where we just let the, the flower sit uh, in those bags and maintain a, you know, 60, 65 degree temperature with 50% humidity if at all possible. If not, you don't want your temperature exceeding 75 degrees. 
and you definitely don't want your hum humidity going over 65 degrees. This product will reabsorb uh, moisture very, very easily. So if you dry your plants, you get the moisture content down to say 10, 12%. And then for some reason, your humidity spikes at 80 or 90% in your building and you don't have proper storage, you will see the moisture content of your dried product go back up to as much as 20, 25%. Um, so trying to maintain a proper environment, proper uh, environmental conditions for long-term storage is important, but it's around the same. Cool temperature, low humidity, 50. If it gets lower than 50%, that's not a huge deal, but you don't want it to get, you don't want to let your material go below 8% moisture content. Once it gets too dry, it becomes really brittle and it will start to just kind of crumble and fall apart on you. And unfortunately, if you let it get that dry, adding moisture back to it won't fix the problem. So the best thing to do is slow dry to about that minimum 10% moisture content, maximum of 15%. And then, I mean, it's a real, it's, it's a, um, a real challenge to properly, properly dry, um, but it can be done and, and it can be done in not ideal environments, right? You can properly dry the material in a, in, in a tobacco barn. Um, usually the weather during this time of the year is, it's cool. Um, you know, during the days we're seeing, you know, 70 degree max, if it gets colder than that, it's fine. You don't want to exceed 80, 85 degree temperatures under any circumstance, because then you start to lose terpenes, um, and, and you start to lose cannabinoids. Also, if the, um, product gets really dry, you'll actually start to have your cannabinoids, your CBD, uh, your CBG or whatever you're growing for, they will actually start to evaporate. Your trichomes, your trichomes will collapse and the um, cannabinoid that you're trying to cultivate will, will simply evaporate. So I would probably say moisture content is more important than temperature. Um, as long as you can keep it around room temperature, that 10 to 15% moisture content is, is key. And there's another question about trimming all the flower. Could you talk a bit about that? Sure. There's a lot of different ways to trim um, the flower. Um, depending on the quality of the material, we have a couple different methods that we use. Um, there are tumble trimmers that are available. There are some flatbed trimmers that are available. There are a lot of trimmers that are available um, that were developed for the cannabis industry that work really well on hemp. Um, Shearline is a trim, a company that makes a tumble trimmer that works really well. Uh, Centurion, um, Twister, uh, the T4 works really well. Um, there's a thing called a trim bag, which is this bag you get. It's like a cylinder. You put your plant, your flower material in there, you zip it up and you shake the bag and it will trim the flower. Uh, it actually works really well. It seems like uh, you're just like, well, how am I going to put my flower in this bag and shake it up? But it, it does work really well. Um, they're cheap. Then there's hand trimming with scissors. Um, that's our kind of preferred method is we take and we trim every bud by hand. Um, I've actually used these at my, in my home. Um, I'll show you a picture of, uh, of a trim bin and what we use. Let me see if I can flip my camera around here. So this is a, a trim bin. Uh, they're, they're made for trimming flour and you just put your flour in here. This one doesn't have any flour in it. Uh, this was for seeds, but, um, and you just use a pair of scissors and you trim in here and then below that you, uh, you collect all of your uh, keef and hash. And uh, so you can use that to make oil or, or tinctures or whatever. So um, our preferred method is, is scissors, but there are, um, you know, machines out there for trimming as well. Great, thanks for showing us that. We have a couple of questions um, back to the growing and cultivation. Um, did you all irrigate your hemp this, this year? No, we didn't. Uh use a drop of irrigation water on, on the hemp at all. 
Uh, I know it was it was brutally dry, and we had problems with some of the vegetable crops and had to put drip lines out for them. But our soil has been lovingly worked for uh, 15 or 20 years and no till for five now. And it really has the capacity. And I, I shouldn't boast too much because Hadley soils all by themselves have the capacity to hold a tremendous amount of moisture. Um, but we're growing hemp in a fairly thick mulch. Um, so we didn't see any slowdown at all. It, it seemed to enjoy that weather. As well, there's a question about um, weed management. And have you had to you know, use different techniques to manage weeds within the crop? I would say uh, weed management on an organic farm is, there's about a hundred answers for that one. We, we've grown uh, hemp with grass paths on either side of it in 2019 and, and we literally mowed the paths. And we just tried to mow as close and carefully as we could. Some of the lower branches would occasionally get mowed over, which was unfortunate. We also have a rolling string trimmer, which was pretty effective at getting under those branches. Um, this year, I would say it was uh, cardboard, cardboard, cardboard cardboard with straw on top of it in some of those bad places in the main patch and uh, cardboard with wood chips on the edges if we were getting into a bad grass situation. The three beds that were former garlic beds that were heavily mulched with straw, I think we just mowed right up against that straw. I, I, would, I would like to say about the, the mulching and going back to that one Dan was just talking about, um, so I, I've farmed hemp in, uh, on the West Coast and, and, and the Plains and the Southeast and, and here in, in the Northeast. And I've seen many, many different uh, methods and approaches to managing weeds and, and hemp. Um, here in New England, um, there is a fungus called septoria that can affect your plant. So if you are doing mowing between your rows or around your plants, try to use a flail mower or a um, bag catching system to catch the clippings and not sling the clippings directly onto your plants. Um, that will definitely infect your plants with septoria and spread that fungus across your field. It won't kill your plants, but it will um, cause some, some leaf die off and some other things. Um, and it just looks more unsightly than, than anything, really. It just leaves little spots all over your plants and um, could lead to mold issues. I haven't seen it so much. But I will say, from what I saw this year, no-till with the um, straw seemed to be the way to go. That was, uh, that was uh, what do you think, Dan? Well, yeah, it was... Uh... It was an amazing difference between the cardboard and wood chips and the straw. And yeah. the three beds that we did in the straw, actually, when we would mow those, Josh, we would always mow, you know, with the clippings blowing away from the crop. Right. So that was the problem. I don't think we had any septoria in those three rows at all. No, not a drop. Um, yeah. I also, I just want to say that those straw beds where we had, where the plants were really successful, those were planted into soil that truly was some of, you know, we were staying up at night wondering how we were gonna deal with that patch of weed. So it really, it's not that like, you know, with no till over time, you are depleting your, your you know, your weed seed is ideally getting deeper and deeper. Um, but, you know, I, I think it really just speaks to bed prep um, and the importance of bed prep and, you know, taking the time to a cult, taking the time, whatever it is you do to get the weeds out and then just mulch, heavy mulching, I think is really the key. Yeah, it certainly worked very well in, in this year. Uh, it protects your soil from some of the heavy downpours and it sure works well uh, in a drought. 
Thanks. I see, I see a question about the worms, and uh, I believe what we had was uh, on the left, I think, is a European corn borer, that green yeah. one. And the real problem with the worms is they don't really eat that much, but when they poop, then the poop makes a rot. And they like to poop where they eat, and so they're eating your buds, and, and it makes a mess. But if you can cut that part of your flower off, ideally taking the worm with it, um, you still can have quite a bit of usable material there. I think the brown one might be a fall army worm, which is yeah. actually kind of a scary one for me as a farmer. I, I hope that's not what it is. I spent a certain amount of time looking at the caterpillar identification sites, trying to figure out what this was. And basically they said, oh, capture the caterpillar. And then when it becomes a moth, you'll know what it was. <laughs> yeah, not, not in my field. But um, what we're hoping is that with all of the predator and pollinator habitat that we've established around the field, that we will continue to breed a lot of predator wasps. And those wasps can really do a number on a wide variety of caterpillars. Um, so it's just a little bit of a question of, can we get the predator and pollinator habitat in good enough shape as we continue to try and grow hemp? Yeah, I would say that um, the, the worms, <clears throat> um, the corn, European corn borer, army worms, and th there's several, several, probably 10 or so different varieties, uh, species of worm that will hit uh, industrial hemp. Um, in, in the two years of uh, farming hemp here in, in New England, I'll say that's the single largest um, pest damage to crop uh, uh, to the crop I've seen is from those worms. Um, there are options. Um, you can you can treat with uh, bacillus uh, during August to try to hit that kind of second wave. Um, prevent ladybugs do well. Um, Lace wigs, um, uh, prey manis. There's a whole host of um, uh, like uh, trichogrammas, uh, the parasitic wasps that do really well. But uh, maintaining that, uh, if you can, banker plants and then just diverse habitat. That's one of the things that Astarte that I really admire about their setup is there's such diverse habitat for so many uh, predatory. Um, insects and to keep that biodiversity going that I do not see the level of pest pressure on their farm that I do on other farms that don't have that diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a question. Do you prune the hemp plants during your vegetative growth period? No, we don't. Well, Josh, you can no. take that. Well, um, so the, yeah, you can you can prune your hemp plants. You can top your hemp plants. Um, it's usually not necessary to. Um, as, uh, the, uh, you guys didn't top anything uh, this year, did you? Uh, nothing on purpose. I think we had a couple of tops blow out in some of those windstorms. Yeah, um, I mean, topping the plant kind of reduces its height and produces lateral, you know, um, shoot development. Uh, it's not required. If you're going to do topping, I recommend doing it very early in the year once the plants are, you know, about a foot high. But I don't recommend topping the plants if they're, you know, two or three feet tall. One thing I just remembered, um, you know, a technique that we didn't end up using this year, but we did, it was in conversation to use, was... Um, uh, cover crop mix for hemp from, I believe it was from high mowing, and that is another option um, to help aid growth and um, suppress weed pressure. So uh, Dan, I don't know if you remember off the top of your head what that was, but cover cropping is a whole nother conversation and, and can be integrated into growing hemp. Yeah, I think high mowing offers a mix that's uh, annual rye and white clover, and I think we even had some of the seed, but the season was getting away from us, or one thing or another, and we did not uh, plant any of that under the under the hemp. It would have been interesting to see. Yeah, 
yeah, that would be a future to do for sure. You know, one thing I just wanted to mention was, and this is a bit of a pipe dream if you'll excuse the expression, um, but it would be growing fewer plants of a higher quality, you know, some really, really tasty bud that's kind of like the craft brew uh, beer as opposed to, you know, the Budweiser massive amounts. And the really unfortunate thing about the way the laws are right now is I can't sell hemp to a Massachusetts resident. So that really throws a major monkey wrench into that dream. But I would like to see this industry developing where we've got hundreds of growers in Massachusetts who are capable of producing a small amount of really high quality crop and uh, get away from some of this huge labor problems uh, that Josh is talking about. I mean, I remember uh, it being all we could do when we had two plants in each arm to walk them out of the field and get to the trailer. It is, it is a pain in the rear. Yeah, I, I think we could do an entire um, discussion on the challenges from a uh, regulatory standpoint, uh, standpoint here in, in Mass um, that, that are facing uh, farmers. Um, and hopefully we'll see some of that change. So. Yeah, and as we're on that point, um, we do recommend that folks, if you're looking to engage in more of the advocacy to connect with the, I'm gonna drop the link into the chat, <clears throat> the Massachusetts Hemp Coalition, um, they are focused on, in, you know, activating people in advocacy to help shape legislation. And as well, there's the Northeast um, Sustainable Hemp Association. They are also active in that, that arena. I want to get back to this one last question. Is there any specific pre-plant for fertility besides compost or general soil amendments that you would use? Um, and the other part of that question is, are, are there any foliar or nutrition or biological sprays used? Uh, we haven't used any, any foliars. Uh, the, the hemp that was growing in the wood chips and cardboard would have been a candidate for uh, that type of treatment. We've used some uh, fermented plant juice uh, extracts from the Korean natural farming technique. Those are usually done as a as a soil drench, and only when we have, you know, like a few problem plants uh, in a row. The pre um, the pre season prep for the soil. I mean, we'd love to have a pea crop for nitrogen. We'd love to have just as many. We like cover crop cocktails, so as many different plants growing in a bed prior to hemp. And this year, unfortunately, mostly what we had was. Uh, torpedo grass and we had torpedo grass up the torpedo. It was, it was a bad section of the field and it was actually kind of miraculous that we had as good a crop as we did. Yeah, there are um, different sprays that you can use. I mean, obviously, um, you know, do a soil test at the beginning of the year, see where you're at. Uh, cover crops are, are legumes, especially huge benefit to those for nitrogen. Um, hemp uses about as much nitrogen per acre as corn uh, from a nutritional standpoint. I would say outside of nitrogen, um, the next two big things I see problems with in soils, uh, calcium and magnesium. Those are, those are very important for healthy uh, development of the, the hemp plant. Um, uh, you can do calcium as a foliar spray. There's um, part of the Korean natural farming method uh, that Dan mentioned. You can make um, a, a bioavailable foliar calcium application pretty easily from eggshells and vinegar. Um, there's also, you know, OMRI listed and certified organic um, calcium supplements that can be uh, applied. If your soil is depleted, try to get calcium in the soil. Um, the next thing too is pH. We haven't discussed pH. Your soil pH should be uh, slightly acidic. 6.5 so is kind of ideal for hemp uh, and its nutrient uptake. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Well, it is 8.32. And as I mentioned, folks are welcome to hang out and we can chat a little bit more. But I do want to just say thank you again to Josh and Dan and Amelia. Uh, thanks again for um, the support from Dr. Bronner's and as well the Bay State Organic Certifiers. Thank you again for joining us, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>